The next session is based on a narrative which is quite similar to the present story of the Indian markets with respect to passive products. Beta shares, one of the top ETF providers in the Australian markets and a mirror asset company has witnessed this shift to passive products from active after a range of regulations were passed in the favor of the advisory business. And which is why we can learn a lot from this session. We are lucky to have Mr. Alex Winokur, CEO, Beta Shares, to educate us regarding this transition. Mr. Alex is, is a member of Beta Shares distribution team responsible for institutional and intermediary broker channel. It's over to you, Alex. Hello, everyone from Australia. Uh, my name is Alex Vinokur. I'm founder and CEO of BetaShares, uh, an Australian uh, ETF issuer. Um, I am uh, terribly disappointed uh, to not be able to join you in person in India. I would have been delighted to do so. Um, but uh, in the age of technology and in the age of Zoom, um, we are at least able to, uh, you know, to speak to each other virtually. So first of all, thank you for allowing me to uh, share a little bit of experience and uh, you know, both good and bad um, you know, from Australia. Um, I have been observing the market in India now for quite some time and certainly feel that the opportunity uh, that the Indian uh, wealth management and funds management industry is presenting um, is for both the investors uh, as well as fund managers um, is really is really quite exciting and quite fascinating. Um, just by way of background, maybe because Australia is a country uh, you know which is far away, of course, um, and uh, may not be overly familiar. I'll just tell you maybe a, a tiny bit um, you know about Australia and 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 really then focus the conversation, of course, um, about uh, the the um, asset management industry, ETFs, and investments more generally. So uh, when I talk about Australia to people who are outside of Australia, I normally describe Australia as a tiny giant market uh, in the context of investments. Uh, the reason why the country is tiny is because our population is tiny. Uh, it's only 25 million um, uh, of people, uh, which of course on a global scale is a very, very small population. Um, the reason why it's a giant uh, market uh, on the other hand, um, and, and, and this is really from the investment side of things, is that Australian uh, investment pool um, is, is one of the largest in the world. Um, Australia, back in 1991, has adopted uh, what we call uh, in Australia a uh, compulsory superannuation system. And uh, in essence, what compulsory superannuation uh, regime has enabled and, and has mandated is that every year, 9.5% uh, of every Australian's salary uh, has to go into a compulsory savings plan uh, for retirement. And uh, in 1991, the Australian funds management industry uh, was, um, you know, the retirement savings industry was about um, $250 billion. And today, so since 1991, uh, fast forward to 2020, uh, the industry is now managing uh, over $3.5 trillion. Uh, placing Australians' uh, retirement savings industry as the fourth largest in the world. So even though it's a tiny country uh, with tiny population by global scale, it's a very significant uh, investment uh, market. Now, interestingly enough, uh, despite the fact that the retirement savings pool has grown so significantly, as I was saying, since 1991, uh, the fees um, that have been charged uh, in the market uh, for investing, um, for, the, for the retail clients to be able to invest, have not really reduced a lot. Um, so the average cost of, of investing in Australia uh, for a very large portion of that time um, has been quite consistent. So even though there's been more than tenfold uh, growth in the, in the assets that have been managed, um, the fees have not come down and the average uh, fee that an investor was paying was about one and a half percent per annum, which is which is of course um, you know a very a very high fee for managing for managing assets. And in addition to that, uh, about ninety percent plus um, of all of the assets were actively managed um, with those sorts of high fees. So of course, if you're an outsider and if you're looking at the Australian market, you'd probably say, look, the active managers must have been doing a pretty amazing job. Uh, because because the, the industry has grown so fast, 
um, and, and the fees have not come down, and the vast majority, of course, is invested with active managers. So that would be a pretty, pretty obvious uh, assumption to make. However, when you look at the facts, um, and the facts are, are, are you know, are very difficult to argue with and very difficult to dispute because um, investment performance is actually measured independently by a number um, of independent parties. Um, so S&P, as an example, uh, runs a, a report um, which, which is run globally um, on every market uh, called the S&P SPIVA uh, Performance Report. And when you look at the performance of active managers in Australian equities or global equities uh, or fixed income, again, either local or global, you'll find that over one, three, five, 10, 15 years, um, about 75% of active managers underperformed the benchmark. So, so again, as an outsider, if you look at that sort of setup, it looks, it looks pretty unusual. You'd say, um, how is that possible that 90% plus of assets are actively managed, yet 75% underperform and the fees are still very high? Um, so um, the, next, um, the next piece in the puzzle to really think about, of course, then is the incentives in the system. And that ultimately uh, provides the answer why Australia was coming from that, from that position before the ETF industry um, you know, really started, um, you know, started to take off. So of course, as always, it's all about the incentive in the system. Uh, the vast majority of Australians who were investing were taking advice from a financial advisor. And the way financial advisors in Australia used to be paid um, is by um, charging a commission, be paying a commission um, via an investment platform. And, and the money was paid from the active manager as a rebate uh, to the investment platform that ultimately got passed on to the financial advisor. Uh, in other words, Australia was not a fee-for-service market. And the only way for the financial advisor to really get paid uh, for the job that they do is to receive those incentive um, uh, payments or kickbacks, as they were referred to in the industry. So, of course, that actually explains um, why we had an industry which was, which was so dominant by active management at very high fees, even though performance uh, was not really there. And that was the moment um, at which Australian regulators um, have decided that, that things have to change. Um, the outcomes for the end investor were, were very negative because if you take that 1.5% uh, per annum fee and you compound it over 10, 20, 30 years that Australians would have until retirement uh, as investors, we're talking about very significant portion of, of the end balance um, you know, for those Australians that would end up shifting away from investor into the hands um, you know, of the fund manager and the advisor. So, so Australian regulators have, have passed what in Australia is called um, uh, FOFA reforms, which effectively are reforms that prohibit conflicted remuneration uh, being paid to the advisor and, and, and effectively meant that financial advisors um, were forced to make a shift uh, towards uh, operating a fee-for-service model. Now, that model, of course, uh, for the first time, has really placed ETFs and index investing uh, on a level playing field uh, because index funds and ETFs were not able to pay uh, the commissions that active managers were able to pay. And that is the reason, uh, or a vast majority um, of the reason, why the um, the level of interest from financial advisors or from the um, from others who, who were recommending uh, investment to clients was never that high. So that was really the point um, that marked a significant shift uh, in the growth um, of passive, uh, lower cost, transparent uh, ETFs uh, on a level playing field with active. Now, I might just take a little detour um, and, and talk a little bit about the active versus passive debate, um, because that debate uh, rages in every part of the world. And, and, and this is something that both active managers and passive managers uh, you know, have strong opinions uh, on. Um, our view at BetaShares, and my view personally, is that the question is really quite irrelevant uh, in many ways. Um, what we believe in is that the most important thing for the client is, is getting their asset allocation right and getting the right mix 
um, at the right um, at the right price point um, of, of investment solutions um, that the advisor recommends. Um, yes, we do know that um, the vast majority of active managers tend to underperform net of fees, but at the same time, there are a lot of very capable active managers, um, and, and, and a lot of them do have the ability uh, to add value. Um, but what we certainly believe in is just having that level playing field where the right products get recommended to the right clients for the right reasons is really, um, you know, the most important, uh, the most important thing. So the, the change that the regulatory reform had brought upon the asset management industry, um, to me, is, is probably most alike um, some of the changes that we've experienced in other industries. So if you look at, if you look at um, the music industry, uh, you know, Spotify had launched and really turned the music industry upside down. Uh, the digitalization um, of, of, of everything we do has disrupted, um, you know, media industry, it's disrupted the retail industry, and absolutely it is disrupting the active management industry or the funds management industry more broadly. So I, I refer to that as the Spotify moment of asset management. And, and when that Spotify moment arrives, and it is very much driven by the regulatory change, because every market around the world, Australia is not special, US was in that, uh, in that position, Canada was in that position, uh, the UK was in that position, Europe was in that position. It's only when, when, when the regulatory change is, is brought um, upon the market that Spotify moment arrives when you have active and passive competing on a level playing field and the industry will never be the same again. Um, so um, what has it done for Australia and where are things in the Australian market at the moment? Um, ETF industry has certainly uh, taken off quite significantly and um, in less than a decade um, the, the industry has grown uh, you know, by more than 10 times. The ETF industry today in Australia is still quite small uh, on a relative basis. The Australian ETF industry is still representing less than 5% of, of all uh, of the entire funds management industry. And if you compare it to the US, um, where the ETF industry is already at 17% or so um, of the funds management industry, or Canada, where the ETF industry is already north of 10%, uh, I think at about 11% at the moment, if, 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 if my numbers are, uh, are correct, um, you can see that in Australia, there's still a long way to go. Australia itself is probably five years or so behind Canada uh, and probably five to 10 years behind the US. But the growth trajectory is very, very significant. The cumulative annual growth rate of the ETF industry uh, in Australia has been over 40% over the course of the past decade. Uh, ETFs in Australia are now accounting for close to 50% of every dollar that gets invested in the managed funds industry. When I started the business uh, with my team about a decade ago, that number was less than 5%. So as you can see, uh, the, the extent of change and the rate of growth um, is very, very significant. And when I look, again, as an outsider at the Indian um, asset management industry, and when I look at the, uh, again, as an outsider, at the Indian wealth industry, I can see that there are some phenomenal opportunities, both for the advisors uh, to start considering um, or continue positioning their business as a fee-for-service business, because that really is the business model of the future, uh, not just judging by Australia, but judging by um, where the world is heading. Um, and also, interestingly enough, for the asset managers. And uh, the team at Mira is obviously doing some great things um, on the active side, but they're also um, doing some terrific thinking uh, and, and some very forward thinking um, on the passive side uh, of the divide, because ultimately, I'll go back to the point that I made earlier. For me, the debate should not be an antagonistic active versus passive debate. I think the debate really needs to focus on the needs of the end clients. And I think if we as an industry um, take that approach, um, you know, I think, I think that's 90% that's of the, um, you know, 90% of the recipe, um, you know, for success uh, into the future. So, so hopefully that provides uh, a little bit of uh, context and a little bit of background of, uh, of what we 
have been going through in Australia. And, um, and again, the, the future for our industry, for the ETF industry uh, in the Australian market, I think is very bright. But I also do believe that the future for active managers uh, is also very bright. And I think the more, um, the more uh, forward thinking uh, active managers uh, are starting to change their business models and starting to change um, the pricing um, on, their, on, their, on their offerings in a way that aligns the outcome for the investor uh, much better um, with the outcome for the fund manager. I think the idea of charging a high fee, whether that fee is one and a half percent or two percent or having a performance fee on top, um, you know, where the end investor basically ends up paying a high fee, irrespective of the outcome. In other words, irrespective of whether that manager is able to outperform the benchmark or underperform the benchmark, doesn't really provide, um, you know, with as much alignment as, um, as some of the models that I think could be developed, um, you know, in the future. Um, but, but in summation, I would say that, that the Spotify moment uh, that certainly arrived in Australia um, many years ago is, is making its way uh, across the world. And, and I think, uh, you know, ultimately, some people certainly have taken the view that, that that moment of disruption is a moment to be worried about. But, but um, I believe, um, certainly from our perspective here in Australia, but I think my, um, my uh, peers in India would probably agree as well, that it's actually an exciting moment. And it's a, it's a moment of opportunity. And, and embracing it and making most of it, um, I think ultimately will make, um, you know, will, 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 will make the difference between a business that is able to, um, to, to survive and prosper in that environment and the business that kind of, um, you know, sort of wills away um, um, you know, sort of as a result of that. So uh, hopefully that's, um, you know, sort of that's been, that's been a little bit helpful. Again, I'm very sorry that I haven't been able to join you uh, in person, but uh, here's a little perspective for you from Australia. Thank you so much, Alex, for an accurate and deep understanding of the growth in the ETF industry and the related shift to the advisory business. I'm sure it will help us get up and embrace the future. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read old scheme-related documents carefully.